a brother uh, wrote this week, and he said, uh, Brother Wheeling, somewhere I have heard that when Jesus and the angels come, that God the Father comes too. And he says, I'm not sure if I heard that from you or where I heard that, but he said it only makes sense. He says, it doesn't make sense for God to stay in heaven all alone for this great event. And he said, can you, can you tell me if this is biblical or not? Well, what do you think? Is it biblical that God is going to come? Jesus said he was. The Bible says he is in several places. It really does not make sense for God to stay in heaven when everyone else is gone. There's a land that is fairer than day, and by faith we can see it afar. For the Father waits over the way to prepare us a dwelling place there. Now, I'm not sure how scriptural that is. Jesus says he was going to prepare us a place. But in the sweet by and by, we're going to meet on that beautiful shore. In the sweet by and by, we shall meet on that beautiful shore. We're going to sing on that beautiful shore the melodious songs of the blessed and our spirits shall sorrow no more, not even a sigh, for the blessing of rest. In the sweet by and by, we're going to meet on that beautiful shore. In the sweet by and by, we shall meet on that beautiful shore. To our bountiful Father above, we will offer a tribute of praise for the glorious gift of his love and the blessing that hallow our days. In the sweet by and by we're going to meet on that beautiful shore. In the sweet by and by we shall meet on that beautiful shore. Did you ever read uh, Sister White's description? I think it's in early writings about the music. How... She said, the music, the music, the singing, indescribable. And we hear, you know, we hear some lovely things down here, human voices. What will it be like to hear millions of angelic voices together? It's going to be wonderful. I'm looking forward to it, and I know you are too. We want to have prayer this morning as we begin. Will you kneel with me, please? Dear Father, what a wonderful hymn we have here. We've sung it so many times. Of the land that is fairer than day. By faith we can see it afar. And we believe, Father, you're waiting for your children to come home. We believe that. We believe that we have been called and chosen in Jesus Christ. We believe that there are mansions and homes and beautiful gardens and places prepared for us there. And we're all planning to meet on that beautiful shore. I ask you to give us your Holy Spirit this Sabbath morning. Comfort and cheer our hearts. Encourage us. Help us to see and comprehend things in your word that we have not seen before. Help us to appreciate the wonderful promises that are ours. And when God speaks, it's done. Only time is required to accomplish the Word of God. There's so many we could pray for this morning, but I want to pray for each one who's present here. We all have needs and desires, and we just lay them at the foot of the cross, and we lay them before you, dear Father. We're trusting, we're waiting, we're hoping, we're believing. And we know the blessings that you have promised and that you have wished for every one of us will come to us in time. We thank you for this Sabbath occasion. May your spirit minister to us now in Christ's name. Amen. Well, I wanted to share a sermon on marriage and wedding this morning. I'm going to anyhow. I don't know if you've ever thought about it or not, 
But the second chapter from the beginning of the Bible is about marriage. And the second chapter from the end of the Bible is about marriage. The Bible begins with a wedding and closes with a wedding. Don't know if you've ever thought of that before. I think that's meaningful. I think it means something. Sister White tells us that when Adam was created, that God was creating a new and distinct order of being. Now, the Scripture tells us that God made man for his pleasure. And I suppose we could read a number of things into that. Maybe we could think that God made us to be as little robots and little toys to move around down here. I don't think that's correct. Maybe God is so high above us that He just wanted little children, you know. Parents love for children, little children especially, to be around sometimes. And maybe God just, you know, wanted some little children. Maybe He made them so they could never grow up intellectually enough that they would ever be anything more than children. But I don't think that's right either. I do believe that when Adam was created, he was a different being than any other thinking person in the universe. I believe that. And I believe that when he was created, he was equipped to experience and to, to experience life and to think thoughts that no other thinking beings in the universe could think outside of God. Some have suggested, and I think it may be true, that the human family was created to be the help meet or helpmate or bride to God. Now, personally, I believe that Adam was created alone as a demonstration of the fact that God is alone. And those who want to insist that God has a woman living in his house in heaven or the Holy Spirit, they want to insist, I think have really missed the whole point of Scripture. I think God is lonely. I don't think he has a wife. I think he wants one. I think he wants someone to live in his house who can take his name, think like him, agree with him, Bring him breakfast, dinner, and supper when it's time. Travel with him when he needs to go somewhere. I think God's lonely. And I believe that we were created to be his bride. There's some wonderful, wonderful things written about the first marriage, the first home, the first family. It was evidently special in Adam's mind. It was so special. Eve was so special to him that when it came to the choice of giving up Eve or giving up life, he chose to give up life. I'm not sure I can fault Adam for that. There was evidently some bond between these two people that uh, you and I can't experience, and the bond was similar to the bond, I believe, between a mother and child and parent and child in that it was a flesh and blood bond because Eve was literally taken out of Adam. The things we're talking about here are much larger than the level we're speaking on, of course. Uh, through the years, Judy and I, serving in pastoral work and in various other lines of ministry, have met people, we have friends, who, for whatever reason, have never been able to have children of their own. They just weren't able to. And some of these folk have adopted children. And you see them, and they love these children, and these children just... I mean, there's a bonding that takes place there. Whether the child is brought into the home in infancy or, you know, 
along in years. There, there develops a, a kinship and a bonding there, and it's wonderful. But it's not the same as your own flesh and blood. It just isn't. You will somehow be more long-suffering and more merciful and more tolerant and more forgiving and more whatever to your own flesh and blood. Not because you don't love others. Not because you don't sincerely love that adopted child, but I want to tell you there is something about a flesh and blood relationship that even God recognizes. There are a number of stories of weddings and marriages in the Scripture, but there's one that I believe is prophetic. It's here in Genesis 24, and I want to ask you to turn there with me. And as we go through this story for a few moments, the only thing I'm going to ask you to do is to wonder with me who the different characters might represent. I mean, we know their names, but who are they standing in the place of? I'm in Genesis 24, and Abraham was old, well stricken in age, and the Lord had blessed Abraham in all things. And Abraham said to his eldest servant of his house that ruled over all that he had, Put, I pray thee, thy hand under my thigh. Now this was a custom, this was a practice that was done. Just like when we go to court and we lift a hand, put one hand on the Bible and lift the other and swear, it's like taking an oath. That's, this was how they took an oath in Abraham's day. Put your hand under my thigh, and I will make you swear by the Lord, the God of heaven and the God of the earth, that you will not take a wife unto my son of the daughters of the Canaanites, among whom I dwell. But thou shalt go unto my country and to my kindred and take a wife unto my son, Isaac. Anyone remember what the name Isaac means? It's joy is the idea. My joy. And the servant said unto him, Peradventure the woman will not be willing to follow me unto this land. In other words, if, suppose I go on this journey to find Isaac, your son, a wife. And she's not willing to leave her home and her family. Peradventure, the woman will not be willing to follow me unto this land. Must I needs bring thy son again unto the land from whence thou camest? And Abraham said, Beware that thou bring not my son thither again. Now this is really strange, isn't it? Abraham says, You're going to swear, I want you to swear to me that you are not going to take a wife for my son out of this place. Not out of these Canaanites. I want you to go back to my land. Now hold on. Where did Abraham come from? Babylon. Well, if that's such a wonderful place, the servant said, why don't I just take Isaac over there? No, you be careful that you don't do that. Does this sound strange to you? All of this is a prophecy. Verse 7, The Lord God of heaven, which took me from my father's house and from the land of my kindred, and which spake unto me, and that swear unto me, saying, Unto thy seed will I give this land. He shall send his angel before thee, and thou shalt take a wife unto my son from thence. And if the woman will not be willing to follow thee, then thou shalt be clear from this my oath. Only bring not my son thither again. Don't take him over there. And the servant put his hand under the thigh of Abraham his master and swear to him concerning that matter. And the servant took ten camels of the camels of his master and departed. For all the goods of his master were in his hand. And he arose and went to Mesopotamia under the city of Nahor. And he made his camels to kneel down without the city by a well of water at the time of the evening, even the time that women go out to draw water. And he said, O Lord God of my master Abraham, I pray thee, send me good speed this day and show kindness unto my master Abraham. What was this servant's name? Was it Eliezer? 
I want to meet this fellow when I get to heaven. I mean, here was a faithful steward. I mean, he could have kept going with all his master's goods. And when he got over there, was he asking a blessing in his own behalf? No, in behalf of his master. I want to meet this fellow. Show kindness unto my master Abraham. Behold, I stand here by the well of water, and the daughters of the men of the city come out to draw water, and let it come to pass that the damsel... Now, that's not a word we use today. I mean, we all know in context what a damsel is, but let's make it simple. What is a damsel? It's a girl. Not even a young woman. It's a girl probably in her early teens, probably 13 or 14, 15. I don't think 15. Let it come to pass that the damsel to whom I shall say, let down thy pitcher, I pray thee, that I may drink. And she shall say, drink, and I will give thy camels drink also. Let the thing be she that thou hast appointed for thy servant Isaac. And therefore shall I know that thou hast showed kindness unto my master. And it came to pass, before he had done speaking, talk about an answer to prayer. I mean, don't you wish all your answers came that fast? But what did Abraham say to his servant? God hath sent his angel, what? Before thee, to prepare the way. Before he had done speaking, behold, Rebekah came out, who was born to Bethuel, son of Milcah, the wife of Nahor, Abraham's brother, with her pitcher upon her shoulder. And the damsel was very fair to look upon, a virgin. Neither had any man known her, and she went down to the well and filled her pitcher and came up. And the servant ran to meet her and said, Let me, I pray thee, drink a little water of thy pitcher. And she said, Drink, my lord. And she hasted and let down her pitcher upon her hand and gave him drink. Now, where was the pitcher? Have you ever seen, you ever seen the pictures of these women over there? They either had them on the shoulder resting against their head like this, or they had it on their head. And I get the idea she's got it right here and she's, giving him a drink of water. When she had done giving him a drink, she said, I will draw water for thy camels also until they have done drinking. That's a lot of water. How many camels did he take? And I want to tell you, there were no Texaco stations along the way. And she hasted and emptied her pitcher into the trough and ran again unto the well to draw water and drew for all his camels. And the man, wondering at her, held his peace, to wit whether the Lord had made his journey prosperous or not. And it came to pass, as the camels had done drinking, that the man took a golden earring of half a shekel weight and two bracelets for her hands of ten shekels weight of gold and said, Whose daughter are you? Tell me, I pray thee. Is there room in thy father's house for us to lodge in? And she said to him, I am the daughter of Bethuel, the son of Milcah, which she bare unto Nahor. She said, Moreover unto him, We have both straw and provender enough and room to lodge in. And the man bowed down his head and worshipped the Lord. And he said, Blessed be the Lord God of my master Abraham, who hath not left destitute my master of his mercy and his truth. I being in the way, the Lord led me to the house of my master's brethren. At great distance, and he wound up right there in Abraham's family. And the damsel ran and told them of her mother's house these things. And Rebekah had a brother, and his name was Laban. And Laban ran out unto the man unto the well, and it came to pass when he saw the earring and bracelets upon his sister's hands. And when he heard the words of Rebekah, his sister, saying, Thus spake the man unto me, that he came unto the man, and behold, he stood by the camel at the well. And he said, Come in, thou blessed of the Lord. Wherefore standest thou without? 
for I have prepared the house and room for the camel. And the man came into the house, and he ungirded his camels and gave straw and provender for the camels and water to wash his feet and the men's feet that were with him. And there was set meat before him to eat, but he said, I will not eat until I have told mine errand. And so Laban said, Speak on. And he said, I am Abraham's servant. And the Lord hath blessed my master greatly. He has become great. He hath given him flocks and herds and silver and gold and men servants, maid servants, servants, camels and asses. And Sarah, my master's wife, bare a son to my master when she was old. And unto him hath he given all that he hath. And my master made me swear, saying, Thou shalt not take a wife to my son of the daughters of the Canaanites, in whose land I dwell. But thou shalt go unto my father's house and to my kindred and take a wife unto my son. I want to ask you something. What relation was Rebekah to Isaac? First cousin. What relation was Sarah to Abraham? Half-sister. Now these folks are not practicing real good genetics. They didn't have to worry. You know, I asked that question and I said what I said so that some of you will think through. This is a prophecy. I am the vine, you are the branches. I and you, and you and me. I ask you at the beginning, who are all these people? And they are not Abraham, and Eliezer, and Rebekah, and Isaac. But thou shalt go unto my father's house, to my kindred, and take a wife unto my son. And I said unto my master, Peradventure the woman will not follow me. And he said, The Lord before whom I walk will send his angel with thee, and prosper thy way. And thou shalt take a wife for my son of my kindred, and of my father's house. Then shalt thou be clear from this my oath, when thou comest to my kindred. And if they give not thee one, thou shalt be clear from my oath. And I came this day unto the well and said, O Lord God of my master Abraham, if now thou do prosper my way which I go, behold, I stand by the well of water and it shall come to pass that when the virgin comes forth to draw water, I will say, Give me a drink. And if she says, I'll give you drink and I'll water your camels too, let the same be the woman whom the Lord hath appointed for my master's son. And before I had done speaking in my heart, behold, Rebekah came with her pitcher on her shoulder. Verse 46, she made haste and let the pitcher down. And she said, you drink, and then I'm going to give your camel something to drink too. And then I asked her and said, whose daughter are you? And she said, the daughter of Bethuel, Nahor's son, whom Milcah bore unto him. And I put the earring upon her face and the bracelets upon her hand. And I bowed down my head and worshipped the Lord and blessed the Lord God of my master Abraham, which had led me in the right way to take my master's brother's daughter unto his son. And now if you'll deal kindly and truly with my master, tell me, and if not, tell me that I may turn to the right or the left. Then Laban and Bethuel answered and said, This thing proceeded from the Lord. We cannot speak unto thee, good or bad. Behold, Rebekah is before you. Take her and go, and let her be thy master's son's wife, as the Lord hath spoken. I want to meet these people, too. Yeah. Now, who was Laban to Rebekah? Who was Bethuel? He was the father, wasn't he? He was the father of this son and daughter. Now, are you prepared to say, take my daughter, I will probably never see her again? Do you understand that that was the same faith exercise that Abraham exercised when he left his homeland and never saw it again? There's something in this family. There's a measure of faith in this, in this family. 
Verse 52, And it came to pass that when Abraham's servant heard their words, he worshipped the Lord, bowing himself to the earth, and the servant brought forth jewels of silver and gold and raiment and gave them to Rebekah. He gave also to her brother and her mother precious things. They ate and drank, and he and the men that were with him and tarried all night, and they rose up in the morning and said, and he said, Send me away to my master. But her brother and her mother said, Please let the damsel abide with us a few days, at least ten. And after that she can go. And he said, Hinder me not. Seeing that the Lord hath prospered my way, send me away that I may go to my master. And they said, We will call the damsel and ask her. And they called Rebekah and said, Will you go with this man? Now these are the words that are used in a wedding. Do you understand that? Will you go with this man? And she said, I will go. And they sent away Rebekah, their sister and her nurse, and Abraham's servant, and his men. And they blessed Rebekah. Now look at this. Don't miss this verse. And they said to her, You are our sister. We want you to be the mother of thousands of millions. Now there's no woman you know that's the mother of thousands of millions. Do you understand this is a prophecy? Look, and let thy seed possess the gate of those which hate them. Now here's a teenager. What does she? Who hates her? What does she know about what's being said here? Nothing. This is a kid. She is happy as a lark with bracelets jangling around, and you understand. She's just like a little girl that's found a tube of lipstick and some dresses and high heels. And somebody is saying to her, we want you to be the mother of thousands of millions. I suppose you had to be 13 years old to do that kind of thing. And Rebekah arose and her damsels and they rode on the camels and followed the man. And the servant took Rebekah and went his way. And Isaac came from the way of the well, La Hai Roy, La Hai Roy, for he dwelt in the south country. And Isaac went out to meditate in the field at the even tide. And he lifted up his eyes and saw, and behold, the camels were coming. And Rebekah lifted up her eyes, and when she saw Isaac, she lighted off the camel. For she had said unto the servant, What man is this that walks in the field to meet us? And the servant hath said, It is my master. And she took a veil and covered herself. And the servant told Isaac all things that he had done. And so Isaac brought her to his mother Sarah's tent and took Rebekah and she became his wife and he loved her. And Isaac was comforted. Now, what we have is a man much older than his wife. What we have is a price paid for this bride. What we have is a long distance and a long wait. What we have is a faith transaction. What we have is someone swearing. We have angels intervening. We have a mother of thousands of millions. And the prophecy will come true that she will dwell in the gate of them that hate her. All of this is a prophecy. It's for you to sort out who Abraham is and who Isaac is and who Rebekah is. I want to tell you that the 24th chapter of Genesis was the theme of Jesus' parables and stories throughout the four Gospels. The prodigal son, the father that saw him coming from a distance and went out. All of this is in this story. It's all here. And it began 
in the second chapter of Genesis with these words, it is not good for a man to be alone. Someone paid a price, went the distance, and waited. It was all directed by the Father. It's an incredible story. I don't think we can, this side of the kingdom, ever plumb the depths of it. I think that there are subtleties contained in this story that have to do with the culture of that part of the world and that age and time, things that had to do with weddings and culture and marriages and kinship that you and I just can't appreciate. We're Gentiles and we're 2,000, 3,000 years away and 5,000 miles away. I don't think we can appreciate everything that's in this story. But I do think that uh, we can ponder this story and wonder why it's recorded. It's recorded for a purpose. And if you'll give some thought and prayerful consideration to this story, and you finally decide who Abraham is, you'll come to understand that he's going to move his home to another country and live there forever which is where the book closes if you understand when we get married uh, we say I love you to one another uh, it doesn't mean nearly as much as it does 20 or 30 years later or two or three children later. It just doesn't. You were not there. I was. I had a good friend with me. We were canvassing. I was the district director. And Christine was one of my canvassers. And I drove all the way up to Sand Mountain to meet Christine, pick her up, and go canvass for the day. We were calling on some lead cards that had come to her. Came to a little town just on the Tennessee-Alabama line up there. One of these little Alabama hick towns, you know, about as wide as three houses. But we couldn't find the address. And the reason we couldn't find the address was it was a mobile home parked behind a house. And after asking here and there for a few minutes, we finally found our way down the driveway and behind the house. And here was a mobile home. And it was almost straight up noon when I knocked on the door. It had one of these glass doors on the front, you know, a storm door, and you could see through. A little black lady appeared in the door, and she had a plate of food in this hand, a fork in this hand, and a mouthful of spaghetti or something. And I smiled, and I held up the little card she sent in the mail. And she couldn't say a word, but she was motioning frantically, you know, don't go away, I want to talk to you. And she put the plate of food aside and welcomed us into her home. Neat, clean little place. <clears throat> I sat beside her. It was my turn to canvas. I had instructed Christine, <clears throat> just like I did with all the canvassers, now when I give the canvas, you pray. You just sit silently and pray. And when you canvass, I'll pray. And I opened the case of books and I <clears throat> remember taking out uh, my big triumph of God's love. That's the great controversy. If you've ever seen the canvassers edition, it has a picture of Thousands and thousands of people all lined up and Jesus is leading them. And He's got a crown and a red robe and this kind of thing. It's not the most beautiful painting in the world, but it is uh, eye-catching. And as I lifted this uh, book from the case, this little woman who was a jabber box just suddenly fell silent. She just had nothing else to say. And because I had been in these situations before and I had seen 
something very similar to this, I knew to just be quiet and not say anything else. And that's what I did. And I just put the book over in her lap. Didn't say a word. Just waiting for her to respond. There was a long pause. I don't know. Minute. When nothing is being said, it seems like forever, you know. Could have been two minutes. Absolutely nothing said. Christine said nothing. I said nothing. And the woman is just sit. Her eyes are absolutely fixed on the cover of this book. And finally she spoke. And this is what she said. There he is, mister. There he is. I still see this little woman pointing at that cover. There he is. She said, that's Jesus. She said, I had a dream. And there he is, mister, right there. She said, in my dream, I was with some friends. And she said, we were sitting on the side of this hill. She says, the grass, it was so beautiful. She says, I can't describe it to you. But she says, we were so happy. We were so peaceful. And we were just talking. And and she said, in my dream, by and by, she said, across the way we saw Jesus coming. And there he is, mister, right there. There he is. She said, the people said, Jesus is coming. A few minutes, he came walking over where we were all sitting on the grass. And she said, he came right over next to me and he called my name. This is what he said. I love you. And she said, he kissed me on the cheek and she put her hand up on her cheek just like that. And she said, there he is, mister, right there. Now, I have no doubt she had a dream. And I have no doubt that Jesus was represented to her like the picture on that book so that we could get that book into her hands. I have no doubt about that. I have no doubt Jesus will look different when she sees him in heaven. But I guarantee you this, she will know him And he will know her. You know, what that little woman was saying was, I'm married. That's what she was saying. I found someone who will love me forever. And that's all any of us need. So, there's nothing more we could wish for, want for, or need. Someone to love us forever. I hope that uh, you'll take the time to read this story again. It's a fabulous story. And if you really want to get into it, look up the names of all of these people and see what their names meant. Because all of their names meant something. Uh, There are a lot of people I want to meet in the kingdom. And I'm not sure... Um, how easily we're going to be able to walk up and converse with folk. We may stand in awe of them, you know. Well, I've read about you for so long or heard about you or whatever. But there are a lot of people I want to meet in the kingdom.